Christian in the room. Sometimes he can feel like that at a church. Not this church, but sometimes at a church. You, you can walk into a, a building where you're supposed to be worshiping God, and you feel like, man, am I the only one here that worships? Am I the only one here that prays? Can we get into a mindset today, the reason why we need fellowship is to interact with other Christians. We need to know there's other people around us that believe and feel the same way that God wants us to feel. We want to make sure that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we need all of us to get into that same mindset. It's so important to commune with each other. It's so important to come together with each other. We need to surround each other with love and care. If something happens to one of our family members or to us, we need to know there is a group and a community that surrounds us and says, I want to get behind you any way I can. I want to be there for you any way that I can. Togetherness, fellowship, that communing spirit is what the Holy Spirit is truly all about. It isn't something that we learn along the way. This is actually something that's built in to the DNA of a Christ follower. When you accept Christ, many of us remember that awesome day. Man, I do. It was just a, it changed my life dramatically. You remember the day that you got saved. Well, on that day, so much stuff happened that your spirit, your mind can't even handle. So we learn about it as time goes on. What happened right there is when you, when you got saved, you came into a family of believers that feel the same way about God that you do. Man, that's exciting. I want to focus specifically on relationships this morning. On relationships and how important it is that the Holy Spirit relation, get, has relations with our hearts and with our spirits. But at first it started. I want to kind of go all the way back and I want to make sure we understand where this started from. If we're talking about the Holy Spirit, then automatically we have to talk about the Trinity. As we talked about last week, it's the three in one. It's all together one. It's one in three. And how does it work? Well, it's a little bit of a mystery, but it's a three in one concept. When you accepted Christ, you also accepted the Holy Spirit. Relationships between the Holy Spirit and you started to commune. But we have to understand where we get that model from. If we call ourselves Christians, that means Christ-like. Everything that we do, we have to model after Christ. The same thing happened with Christ and the Holy Spirit. There was a communion there. Our relationships together reflect the relationship that Jesus had with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to focus on today. In my years as a Christian, I've heard this statement multiple times. And maybe you've heard this too. What is spiritual is also physical. And what is physical is spiritual. Well, what does that mean exactly? It means what's happening in the spiritual realm around us reflects and affects the physical realm around us. If there's battle in the spiritual realm, then there's battle inside yourself. There's battle physical. There's a spiritual battle going on. It's my job and it's my duty today to talk about the relationships that Jesus Christ had with the Holy Spirit and how we can reflect that in our own lives. Is that okay with you guys today? Man, I hope so because that's what we're doing. <laughs> that fellowship, we're going to discuss that fellowship. Remember last week when I quoted the Apostle Paul and he said, God is love. Jesus is grace, and the Holy Spirit is the fellowship side. That fellowship is what we're going to discuss today. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 4.4. 4. If this series had a subtitle, it would be the Holy Spirit and Jesus. The Holy Spirit and Jesus. As we're turning there, I want to make a special point that there are many times in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit was referred to as the Spirit of the Lord. Anybody ever read that before? As you read it on, you come across and it says the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of God. This connection changes when we hit the New Testament. When we hit the New Testament and we learn about Jesus, it becomes the Spirit of Christ. When Christ was died and He was resurrected, we're going to get to a lot of that today. 
when he, when he was resurrected and all of a sudden he went up to heaven, to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. We are blessed with the Holy Spirit that he gave us, but it is known as the Spirit of Christ. And we see this intimate relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the correlation here in Galatians. And it says this, But when the right time came, God sent his Son, born of a woman, subject to law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. How like that if you can. Prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. What a powerful powerful part of scripture. It deals with who we are directly. We're no longer just existing beings. We're no longer slaves to the law. We become joint heirs with Christ. Man, what does that mean for you and me? It means what is his is ours. All of a sudden when Christ died and we accept that holy, holy thing that happened, we start to understand that we become kings and queens. We become royalty in the sight of God. Now, we may not feel that way. And we may not see it that way. And our day-to-day -day life may not reflect that way. But in the eyes of God, the Spirit of Christ has made us free and clean. We see a promise here. A promise through Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We are no longer slaves to the law. We are no longer the people who are oppressed. The Holy Spirit and Jesus have made it clear to us that we are special in the eyes of God. We get to experience this every single day. We have to remind ourselves who we are through the Holy Spirit. And if it wasn't for that, we are nothing. That's where the celebration of fellowship comes in. We can know and experience the Holy Spirit through Jesus' resurrection. We can know and experience the Holy Spirit through communion like this. And somebody shaking a hand and hugging a neck. Somebody saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Somebody picking up the phone and calling and saying, I'm thinking about you. I know you're going through a rough time, but I was checked and the Holy Spirit told me I should call you. Is everything okay? Sometimes we miss out on that opportunity. We call ourselves too busy. And we get wrapped up in our own life. When we start thinking about somebody, we simply stop there. The push of the Holy Spirit says, pick up the phone. Write the letter. Type the email. Send the text. Do something to say, hey, look, the Holy Spirit is checking me about you. Are we doing that today? We see this perfected in the life of Christ. Remember, he's our example for everything. He's our example for everything in existence. I want to show you this morning that we only have one point today, and that's the life of Christ. The relationship between the Holy Spirit and Christ is so important. And we have to see that and understand that the, the life of Christ is our example today. We see it in his birth, in his baptism, in his struggles in life, in his miracles, in his ministry, everything, we see that relationship so close and we think to ourselves, why don't we have the relationship of the Holy Spirit like Christ did? Well, it was Christ. Well, that was Christ, but wait a minute. Go back. We're joint heirs with Christ. If we've accepted Him as God's Son and we understand that, we have that power too. We have the power to light up our life. We have the power to flip the switch Let's look at some examples this morning of the life of Christ and in our life today and compare those two. Let's look at the birth of Jesus Christ. The birth of Christ. This is so cool. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And it says, and this is the angel talking to Mary. I'm going to take it back to Christmas. Y'all ready? Y'all have jingle bells, y'all. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. 
Notice who shows up. Notice who shows up when all of it's said and done. It was the Holy Spirit. The angel come and he said, listen, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and, and all of a sudden things is going to change. The world's going to change. The Holy Spirit shows up and everything changed. We have to understand. We give Christ the glory and I, I want us to do that. But we also have to understand and know if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, it would not have happened. It was the will of the Father, though. So it did. We know this to be a prophecy in the Old Testament. The, the prophet Isaiah. If you go back and look at his, his uh, chapter his book, man, we just see that all in Isaiah. He prophesied Christ 400 years before it happened. He prophesied Christ all of these times. He said he's going to be born of a virgin and, and all these things. And so he prophesied this and all of a sudden that's what happened. So we see the correlation at his birth. He was born of a woman who had known, not known a man. He would have no human father. And we find this hope in this fact that our own spirits perk up because this was the one who would save humanity. This was Christ. The Messiah. But if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit in your This is the entire basis of salvation. We know that we who we are and we're confident in who we are because of Jesus Christ. As many of you know, moving on forward, the Holy Spirit was present in the baptism of Jesus. This is that story right here. Matthew chapter 3 verse 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, we've all seen the cartoon. Y'all remember this one? When he came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and setting on, settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. You see, this was the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. This was the beginning. This, as soon as he was baptized, something happened. The heavens opened up. The Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, it said. And all of a sudden, the light was turned on with Jesus. The power was there. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes, He brings the power. He brings the confidence. He brings the mission. And all we have to do is flip the switch on. And here comes the power. Amen? He brings the light when it comes down to darkness. And He saw this baptism and He said, this is the moment I've been waiting for. This was the start. Crank the thing and put it in drive. Well, let's go. This is what's the beginning of Jesus' own ministry. You see, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And we've said that here before. Baptism, when we become baptized, when we get baptized, it's not just dunking somebody in the water. You can do that anywhere. But when the Spirit of God is in place, that's the difference. That's the juice. That's the power. We want the Spirit of God to come upon us just like it did Jesus. We need that power to fight and face the daily life that we're faced with every single week. If you haven't been baptized, I will encourage you right now to, to prayerfully consider a baptism. Maybe you got baptized when you were a little kid and you just don't remember it. Listen, make that dedication to God. Maybe you've been struggling with some confidence issues. Maybe you struggle with something in your life. Consider a baptism. In the seat pocket in front of you, there's a connection card. I want you to, if you're interested in baptism, man, fill it out. Give it to me after service. And on that card, it says, interested in baptism. It's a little checkbox. And we want to baptize you. We want to make sure that you have all the tools you need to take on the week. Amen? Our prayer life should reflect this. <coughs> When we pray, we should ask the Holy Spirit to divinely intervene in every aspect of our life. Jesus started his ministry by being baptized. We should do the same thing. That's why in the New Testament, the apostles would call out the people and say, get saved and then what? Be baptized. 
It's one or the other. Let's get saved and let's be baptized. Why? Jesus, if it was good enough for Jesus, hey, it's good enough for me. Is that right? right? Man, that's what I'm talking about. If you haven't been baptized, prayerfully consider a baptism. We will do a special one just for you. I promise you. And then, let's walk through this life of Jesus. He, he was born, he lived, he was baptized, he started his ministry. But how does he start his ministry? How does he really get started? And we, we saw the Holy Spirit through the whole thing. And now we're at this point where he is doing something that caught my eye, always catches my eye when I read this. He was tempted. He was sent off into the wilderness and tempted. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by who? The Spirit. Into the wilderness. To be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. If you read that, you go, what? You know, we all know the story of how he was tempted. We all know that we've read it before. But listen, the Bible says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Why? He was Christ. He, he, he couldn't, why did he need to do this? Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus, the Messiah, the one born of a virgin, all these things, into the wilderness, and he got hungry, and he got thirsty, and all these things? I've come to the conclusion that if there's anything to highlight or underline, I like to make notes. I don't know if you noticed that. In your Bible, you highlight, you underline, into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. When we think about the wilderness, what comes to our minds? When we think about the wild, what comes to our mind? Now, some of us, sometimes me, more times like 60% me, it's like adventure. You know what I'm saying? Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, I think that's a, the, the heart of a man. We need to be in the wilderness. <laughs> Kill a bear with a bare hand or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, into the wilderness, and some other, some of us, uh, others of us will go into the wilderness. That's not for me. I'm going to sit in the house on the couch there, <laughs> close the door, lock it, make sure no wilderness is inside. If there's a spider, man, goodness forbid that there's a spider inside your house. I can hear it screaming from like outside. <laughs> spider! <laughs> you know. That was, that was loaded. Anyway. <laughs> so I beg the question again. Let's, uh, there's so many things we think about into the wilderness. <clears throat> Let's think about this question again. Why would the Spirit of Christ, why would the Spirit of God lead Jesus into the wild? Here's the short answer with a deep, deep, deep. You can't lead anyone where you haven't already been. Amen. You can never lead anyone. Where you haven't already been. Christ was tempted. Remember our first scripture where it says he was subject to the law. He was 100% man, 100% God. He was all these things. And he could not lead us to say no to temptation if he himself hadn't already been into the wilderness. How many people have been into the wilderness today? You understand and know that in the wilderness, there's one common denominator in the wilderness, and that's the unknown. Whether you're excited about the wilderness or you're, you're scared of the wilderness, the one thing you have to understand and know, it's unknown. You have no clue what's ahead of you. But through Christ, if the Spirit of God had not led him into the wilderness, then he would have not resisting the temptations. He's God. He can, he can do it. He, he does it. We understand that that's Jesus. That's who he is. But he would be he wouldn't be our example if he failed. We go through certain situations of uncertainty, unknown, and when we find that in the wilderness, I believe we live in the wilderness. Amen. Spiritually, that's where we are. And he leads us and he guides us. You see, the Holy Spirit not only led Christ into the wilderness, but He led Him through the wilderness. Amen? He'll do the same for you. 
He's our example. This is what we can take from this relationship shared in the wilderness. That when the wilderness, you see you have hard times. We can call upon the Spirit and He can remind us of scriptures that we need. That's exactly what Jesus did. He could, well, how did He defeat Satan? He quoted the Word of God. He says, the Word of God says, the Word of God said, each time the Word of God says, now, get away from me. You want to know what to pray when you're in the wilderness? You know how the Spirit leads you into the wilderness? You need to read the guide through the wilderness. Amen. Jesus not only survived it, he thrived in it. Are we thriving in the wilderness? Are we moving forward in the right direction? Jesus left the wilderness. He went to full-time ministry. He called all his disciples. He did many miracles. He did all. He spent three and a half years in this world. He died for our sins. Listen to the Apostle Peter's words about this. Acts chapter 10. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Peter, at this point in his life, recognized that through the Holy Spirit, that's where the power came from. That's where the push came from. That's where the lights, that's where the lights came on at, was the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't until after Jesus left that he received himself. It wasn't until after Jesus left they were all gathered around in that upper room. Acts chapter 2, check it out. But listen, he was there, all the rest of them were there. And then the Holy Spirit came and gave them power. And then all of a sudden, Peter starts doing something he's never done before. And that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said 3,000 people came, came to save them. We have to understand and know that it's called light it up for a reason. We have to flip that switch on that God gives us. We have to flip on the power of where it comes from. We see the Holy Spirit's presence in the death and the resurrection of Christ. Remember, we're just walking through his life really quick for like 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. This by no means give justice to what really happened. The Holy Spirit's presence in the death and the resurrection. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Just think how much more blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. This is what the Holy Spirit led Jesus to do. He was unblemished, but yet he died for our sins. He gave himself, a person without sin, in a world undeserving of salvation. It's exactly what he's done. And the Holy Spirit and Jesus accomplished this through his ministry here on earth. When he was resurrected, we see that power too. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, and he was raised to life where? In the Spirit. We come back to this one certain point in time. We come back to this point, that the Holy Spirit is the power. The Holy Spirit is the guide. He's the comforter. He is everything. And we don't give him justice. So what can we learn from this relationship? What can we learn from a holy fellowship between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? That we too can have a deep, close, unfiltered relationship. There's a moment in time where we're here and we're in this knowledge and we have this emotion and our heart speaks and our heart longs for something deeper with Christ. And we're at that point in time where we need to jump or get off the boat. The Holy Spirit says, 
I need you to swim to shore because that's where Christ is. I need you to get to where Christ is. I need you to get closer to Him because if we can have fellowship, you're unstoppable. I want to invite our prayer team to come down right now. Because here's what I believe. I believe there's people here that need a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want to say again, a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit. You've accepted Christ and you're walking your way. But a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit, what does that mean for you and me? It means discernment. <coughs> the power to see and do the right thing in the Spirit of God. It, it means uh, courage. It means to get out and do what you're supposed to be doing all along. And that fear has no part of your life whatsoever. Because fear and the Holy Spirit, they don't get along too well. Fear and the Holy Spirit, they see each other in different ways, in different lights. There we are. See, there he is. <laughs> Not going that way anymore. Fear. Fear is the anti-spirit. You need a deeper relationship with Christ. You need a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Or you just need somebody to pray with you. We're all ready to pray. Are you? Let's sing one more time. <laughs>